Ray Armentrout is one of the founding members of the West Coast Group of Language Poets, author of 15 collections of poetry, including Verst, winner of Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, as well as National Book Critics Circle, Wobble, finalist of National Book Award, and Conjure, finalist of Penn Award. For many years, she taught poetry at the University of California in San Diego. In one of the poems from her latest collection, Finalists, Ray Armentrow asks, what's to like, if not contrast? This question remains vital for Ray Armentrow's entire poetic work. Her short-lined, contrastive poems seek to dismantle conventions of identity, memory, language, economy, culture, as well as science. She seeks out contrasts and exposes them with figurative intensity as well as insight. According to the critic Stephen Burt, quote, William Carlos Williams and Emily Dickinson together taught Armentrout how to dismantle and reassemble the forms of stanzaic poetry, how to turn it inside out and backwards, how to embody large questions and apprehensions in the conjunctions of individual words, how to generate productive clashes from arrangements of small groups of phrases. From those techniques, Armentrout has become one of the most recognizable and one of the best poets of her generation. Today, she will open April conference with a plenary talk entitled Disquiet. Well, thank you for that introduction, Mikhail. And um, thank you, Consul Nickerson and uh, distinguished professors all for inviting me. Um, and I don't know that I've ever given a plenary address before. As a poet, I'm not, it's not usually what I do. So I'm a little intimidated. But to start, in the United States now, Public discourse is full of certainties, the loud voices of people who never seem to ask themselves how they know what they know. These voices are often full of vitriol and hate. Is it a coincidence that this happens as the Earth's climate becomes increasingly inhospitable? Perhaps so, but it couldn't come at a worse time. We need two things now that are hard to come by, modesty and new ideas. I'm not sure that I can claim to offer either of these, really. I was asked originally, I thought, to talk about my own writing, and I will, trying to give it some context. I grew up in a family and a culture that didn't believe in explanation and didn't allow for doubt. Do it because I said so, my father said. My mother said, it's true because the Bible says it is. To say the least, this made me ask myself, why? Since I couldn't ask my parents, I learned to write my questions down. And from hearing hymns and children's rhymes, I learned that certain combinations of words had a kind of magic. Poems could make words memorable, and they could also soothe no matter what they said. In fact, it's striking how many children's rhymes are really about disaster. When I was beginning to write poetry, as you just heard, my influences included Emily Dickinson and William Carlos Williams. I admired Williams for the quality of his attention to the ordinary to ordinary things and to the quotidian. I admire Dickinson for her boldness, a quality especially startling in a 19th century female poet. I want to say a bit more about her influence in particular. When I encountered her poems, I saw a kind of radical compression in them that stunned me. By radical compression, I mean the way Dickinson could merge seemingly antithetical categories or ideas to form what I'm calling chimeras. Um, I, I won't explain what that means. <laughs> I'll give two examples from her famous poem. Well, this is a, there are two number systems, but um, 
I'm calling it uh, poem number 986. As you know, she didn't title her poems. The first stanza reads, a narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have met him, did you not? His notice sudden is. It may take many readers a while to pick up on the fact that she is talking about seeing a snake. This is because the descriptive terms are so unsettled. They resist one another. Such surprising word choices might be awkward in someone else's hands. In Dickinson's poems, however, they wake us up. They open us up, perhaps. One may talk, I mean, uh, let's see. The word narrow, for instance, is not usually used to describe living creatures. One may talk about a narrow escape or a narrow passageway. Narrow has slightly unpleasant connotations. It's claustrophobic. On the other hand, the word fellow has positive, friendly associations. It suggests fellowship and joviality. So here she is joining the fearful to the familiar. I know that later there are going to be um, panels on the gothic and uh, the grotesque, so I think this might be, uh, she might be a candidate for um, such a panel. My good fellow, the British used to say, one would generally think of a fellow as a man, but men are slender, not narrow. So what is this narrow fellow in the grass? He's, not, he's in the grass, not on the lawn. He is someone or something one sees suddenly. His notice sudden is. Such notice often provokes fear. A poem makes the reader go through a slow process of sudden discovery, if that makes sense. At the end of the poem, having met this fellow creature, this snake, leaves Dickinson with a feeling of zero at the bone. I should have actually made a projection of, of her poem, but I didn't. As she merged the dissonant associations of narrow and fellow in the first stanza, in the last she unites the highly abstract word zero with the very concrete word bone. When we are frightened by something, we might say it gives us a chill. It's chilling. You could interpret this line in that way, but you would lose a lot. Zero represents absence, the void. The cold zero invokes, the cold that zero invokes is so much larger than an ordinary chill. If you have zero at the bone, and that preposition is interesting too. Sometimes we say that the, uh, the dogs have gotten at the chickens, for instance. So at is a sort of aggressive preposition there. Um, then one's bones are hollow. The solidity of bone dissolves. Zero at the bone is a four-word phrase that invokes not only the scare of seeing a, that seeing a snake might produce, but beyond that, a sense of obliteration. When I discovered this technique of Dickinson's, this capacity for what I am calling radical compression, I knew I wanted it for my own poems. And perhaps it was also her rather exuberant uneasiness that I connected with, her active disquiet. It's hard to move from Dickinson to talking about myself, because in my mind Dickinson is incomparable, but here goes. What are poems anyway? For me, poems are spaces of bounded disquiet, or at least mine are. Bounded how? Within a series of words that almost balance or balance shakily. If the balance is lost, the disquiet will spill out all over. Is that a bad thing? Might that not be what one sometimes wants, a bit of primordial chaos? Yes, but... If too much of it escapes, the energy of the thing is lost. Most of my poems are, or at least begin with, an unspoken question, such as, what was that I just felt? Why? Did I really see what I thought I saw? What does it mean if X is true? What does it mean to be true? Sometimes I test out various assertions in poems. You could think of my poems as thought experiments. 
the interplay of overt spoken statement and unspoken question play out in the following poem. And so now I think we are going to display the poem Lions. Okay. So, as I said, assertion and question. Lions. Lion taming exists to make us think that the ferocity of lions is fake. Or lion taming exists to parody our sense of human mastery over the earth. Of course, any thought is a shot in the dark, but a poem exists to contain it. Now a thought is a watched pot. What are some of the questions this poem raises? Well, obviously, what is the appeal of lion taming? Why does it still exist in circuses? Are either of the proposed answers in the first two stanzas correct? Both might sound plausible, yet they contradict one another. They're wild guesses on my parts, part. Shots in the dark, as we gun-crazy Americans say. Electrical discharges, I prefer to think, in the darkness of one's brain. The poem exists to contain such wild and perhaps uncomfortable thoughts, to let them or to make them exist in parallel. Does it contain them in a sense that a box contains a gift, or in the sense that ferocious impulses need to be caged? Is the poem a pleasing container with its rhyme between thought and pot, and its pairing of traditional sayings, neither of which is to be taken at face value? That question must be left to the reader. The last stanza recalls the old saying, and I'm sure this is not really <laughs> familiar to Polish speakers, but the last stanza recalls the old saying, a watched pot never boils. I don't know whether there's an equivalent to that in Polish. We watch a pot either because we're afraid it will boil over or more often perhaps because we're impatient for our meal and want the water to boil right away. The saying means that when you actively wait for something to happen, it seems to take forever. Should you turn away, distract yourself? What happens if you turn your back on lions? The voices in the first two stanzas sound so confident, as if they were in the know, although I, the writer, can't really imagine why lion taming persists. Am I trying out serious explanations or mocking the voices of people who are too certain of themselves? Both, I guess. With me, it's always both. I'm aware of the fact that a poet has little control over how her poem will be heard, especially in another place, language, culture, or even across time, for that matter, if it survives. Generalizations may be disproved over time. On the other hand, they may become commonplaces. Particulars can become obscure over any kind of distance. Yet it is with particulars and generalities in counterpoint that thinking and thus writing work. Across such distances, we find ourselves estranged and yet need to connect. I wrote about all this explicitly, well, fairly explicitly, in a poem called Parting Shots, which is in my Polish selected poems, Dark Matter, translated by Kaksper Barczak. This poem, Parting Shots, was originally in my 2013 book, Just Saying. I'll admit that the first section of the poem was inspired by a Ken Burns documentary I watched on television about the national parks in the United States. Things to come to us however they will. Okay, can we display parting shots now? Okay. So it's in two parts. One, long, confident sentences of the early visitors, so unlike ours, so much like one another, remark on the sculpted grandeur of the walls, and then with one light touch on the bracing sense of insignificance that they impart. Two, beyond the only wall in sight, 
the defamiliarized wall, a sniper tells a camera crew his work is invigorating because it's personal. The first section, as I just said, was inspired by the language of early tourists at the Grand Canyon as presented in a Ken Burns documentary. The second part is taken from an interview that an on-scene embedded reporter did with an American sniper during the early days of the Iraq War. What the two parts have in common is, well, a wall appears in both. <clears throat> the, one, the one the tourists admire and the one the sniper hides behind. As a listener, I experienced my own sense of estrangement while listening to both of these programs. The language of the early 20th century park visitors sounds strange with its polished sentences and its willed modesty. They want to feel insignificant. They sound like people of means, of leisure, for whom insignificance is exotic. Um, then the soldier's bizarre statement makes the present, or the recent past now, strange, not only because of the way it normalizes killing, but also because killing is apparently how this man connects with Iraqis. It's personal, he says. Is that because he has a personal grudge against every one of them? Unlikely. It's more probable that he likes being able to see the result of his work. This seems like a perverted version of the way Marx thought a worker should be able to see and enjoy the completed product of his or her labor. Both sections reveal an artificial, troubled, and in the case of the sniper, chilling way of relating to the world. And what about me? I suppose I bring this trouble to you, paradoxically, hoping for connection. There has been a tendency in US poetry recently to treat poetry as a kind of self-help in which one learns to make affirmative statements about one's identity. Can this be a healthy activity for teenagers in general and especially for disadvantaged youth? Yes, I suppose so. But it still seems a bit myopic. Surely a poem can do more than affirm what we already think or hope that we know. In my view, poems must wrestle with the world as infants do when they learn how to shape objects from the sensory chaos they initially perceive. As children grow up, their habits of perception become unconscious. For poets, this doesn't or shouldn't quite happen. In practicing their crafts, poets must constantly ask how this fits with that. Coming back to the old questions of how, what, who, who do I hear speaking? Who am I when I speak? These are good questions to ask ourselves now in this age of widespread disinformation. Now it sounds as if I'm beginning to do what in the States is called a craft talk. In a craft talk, visiting poets are invited to convey to student writers the tricks of their trade. I'm uncomfortable doing craft talks because, although I do have opinions on these matters, I've been sharing some with you, I don't have full confidence or certainty in the truth of my opinions. This ambivalence is exemplified in a prose poem called The Craft Talk in my book, Wobble. So now let's display... The Craft Talk, a prose poem, obviously. So that the best thing you could do, it seemed, was climb inside the machine that was language and feel what it wanted or was capable of doing at any point, steering only occasionally. The best thing was to let language speak its piece while standing inside it. Not like a knight in armor, exactly. Not like a mascot in a chicken suit. The best thing was to create in the reader or listener an uncertainty as to where the voice she heard was coming from so as to frighten her a little. Why should I want to frighten her? The poem enacts a conflict between a distrust of, it, of authorities and the fact that the person giving a craft talk, or in fact a plenary address, must impersonate an authority, at least for the moment. There is also the tension between the speaker's desire to surrender to language, which a poet must do, and her equally pressing need to control it, which a poet must also do. 
The images of authority the poem invokes are absurd, of course, a knight in armor or a sports mascot in a chicken suit. Perhaps because the speaker is, because I am, a woman, I find it hard to put on the mantle of the expert. Would I rather put you on instead? My poems often lead to double binds, to mutually exclusive conclusions, leaving the reader to think it through for his or herself. Is the speaker, am I, being sincere when I appear to state beliefs? Where is this voice coming from? To not know a thing like that can be scary. It's a fear I share with the reader I have conjured. Perhaps here we can laugh at it together. The American poet W.H. Auden famously said, poetry makes nothing happen. And people have been trying to interpret what he meant by that ever since. If it's true, I hope it's because poetry creates uh, an open space, an opening in which we can ask questions and share our, share our uh, possible answers. OK, now, I'm, uh, I just decided I would add one last poem to my presentation. Um, it's a, a sort of a new poem that plays with my ambivalence about opinions. So can we get my opinions up there? Now, I don't even have it here, so I'm going to have to turn away a bit to read it. My opinions. I don't foster opinions, as some of my friends do. Sometimes one pops up, fully formed. I have even been asked to host them. Then I trot them out, unhappily, and stand at some distance. I dislike them, as I dislike clutter, or a person who constantly interrupts as I try to focus on the wormhole in my blind spot. OK, well, I'll end with that, and you'll see if you can find any questions to ask. Thank you.